great crested newt is the largest of our native newt species um, and as such it is also the most exacting in its water requirements so if you find a thriving great crested newt population breeding in a pond you can be pretty sure that the pond is of incredibly good water uh, quality and there'll be a host of other species benefiting like caddisfly, mayfly, damselflies and dragonflies pond snails, ram's horns. Um, it's not just about the newt, but the newt, the great crested newt is a good indicator species and it's beautiful. The features of a healthy pond are usually, it should be sunny, open, masses of pond vegetation and by that I mean the emergence along the edges, the water mint, the watercress, um, rushes and then within the pond the floating aquatic plants like broadleaf pondweed and the submerged aquatics, curled pondweed, stonewort, um, starwort, that sort of thing. For a great crested newt, they are very particular about what plants are growing because they need certain sized plants to actually lay their eggs on. Um, and usually if you have a range of aquatic species, you're going to find some that the newt will like. Well here I'm going to do what I do at every pond in the spring and I'm going to look for eggs and I'm going to look for larvae and possibly catch a newt or two but obviously I can do that because I have a newt license but as they're a protected species um, I need one. So what I'm doing is I'm parting aside the various leaves looking for submerged folded leaves. Now there's one on a water mint. There's multi-folds on a water mint plant under the water submerged and then to check their great crested newt eggs what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out one of the folded leaves Oh, and try not to fall in the pond and I'm going to open it and there is a great crested newt egg and it's it's bigger than a smooth newt egg and it sort of has a white yellowish tinge and it's laid in a lump of jelly to protect it and the female does this she backs up to a plant lays the egg folds it with her back legs and she'll lay about 200 of these and that's quite a job There's one developing a bit further on now. It's actually, you can see, and there's one just about to hatch. That one is one that's just about to hatch. You see that little lime green egg, a lime green tadpole, it's just all curled up and it's just about to be released. Okay, so in this one we've actually got three eggs, if not four, four eggs on one leaf in slightly differing stages of development. I think what's absolutely critical from the newt point of view is that everyone thinks of great crested newts as pond creatures. They're actually not. They're, they do part of their life cycle in the pond, but an awful lot of their life is dependent upon um, really nice grass and full of insects and slugs and things they can eat, hedges that connect the different ponds. Um, and so it's the management of the terrestrial habitat that is also so important. Right, well I've got a large um, female great crested newt here. I know she's not a male because she hasn't got a jagged crest down her, her back, but actually if you get the male out it flops over anyway. Um, and she's large, she's grainy, dark looking, and um, there's no mistaking that she's a great crested female full of eggs. She's got this lovely orange and blotched spotted underbelly, which of course smooth newts have as well, um, which can cause some confusion, but it's her size that means you should never uh, muddle her up with a smooth newt. What I've got here is a male great crested newt and you can see that his crest has actually flopped over when I take him out of the water um, and he's the other diagnostic feature really about him is he has a stripe, a stripe in the middle of his tail, a white stripe and that's, he puts to great effect underwater 
as he shimmies around the female at courting time and he lashes it and shivers it and you see this white tail flicking around. He also has the very grainy skin with white sort of granular looking effect and if I lift him up underneath he's got that same blotchy orange bright red orange stomach and gonads at the back and now he's flashing his tail because he's a little bit angry with me and you can see his crest has flopped over on this side he's blowing a bit in the wind there okay well this little chap I think he needs to get back in the water Well, Suffolk Wildlife Trust has, since 2003, had an ongoing pond project uh, and we have one person dedicated to surveying ponds, that's myself, um, in, especially during the spring and summer months, and giving advice to uh, landowners and others who want to improve their ponds for wildlife. started off in um, 1998 when we decided for the millennium we would um, write a book um, about what was happening in the village and what was in the village, listing the ponds and um, the things that go with the ponds as well as the greens and uh, the hedges, we did all the hedges and everything else associated with it. But also part of that project was to clean out some of the ponds and to encourage wildlife back to the ponds. But the ponds are so brilliant it's lovely to find out what we've got there and so over the past few years I've been trying to find out a bit more about what we've got living and growing there and especially about the newts because the newts are big stars they're great and so recently I've done a course with Juliet here to find out about great crested newts it was a an identification course so that we could identify the, the eggs and look at the animals and eventually what we want to be able to do here in the village, once I've got my newt license, hopefully I'll get, is to be able to go around with a torch at night and show people in the village these wonderful creatures in the ponds and also to be able to monitor the newts and make sure that we still have healthy populations and that they're doing well. Yeah. The, the thing is with newts is that they will travel up to a kilometre if they get the whiff of a nice, clean, healthy pond. And if you've got newts in the area, they're very long lived, they'll live up to 12 years. So in fact, if you restore a shaded, silted, neglected pond, they will move in very quickly and recolonize. Well, here, here is an example of a, a pond at the edge of an arable field that's been incredibly shaded. It's full of silt and leaf litter and organic matter. And the farmer has started to open up the pond. He's coppiced the uh, bigger trees and shrubs on the margin. And the next step is to remove the organic matter and spread it on the arable after harvest. And because we are well connected with a hedge and grass margin here that leads all the way to the green, the newts will walk up to a kilometre in search of a newly restored pond like this. And I bet you within a couple of years this pond is going to be absolutely gorgeous. From an agricultural perspective or, or advice that I would um, give, is to try and get into some of these agro-environment schemes by take, think, looking at what you've got on your farms and what is around you and trying to see where you can improve things. Maybe by cleaning out your ponds and things and making more natural habitat for the things that are around. Well I think from the community point of view, if you want to improve your pond, you go to the Wildlife Trust to start with for advice as we did here and they help us with volunteers with expertise which is really really important to know what you've got what you might have and then you can go on from there I would say to someone that says they want to improve their pond for wildlife firstly does it need improving 
Uh, is it simply choked with vegetation that you don't like, but perhaps some dragonfly does like, the great crested newt likes? So if you're not 100% sure of what you're doing, it is worth having a pond survey, taking advice, and obviously we're there to help you if you want some.